Listen to a conversation between a student and a librarian. Can I help you? Yeah, I need to find a review. It's for my English class.、Uh, we have to find reviews of the play we're reading, but they have to be from when the play was first performed. So I need to know when that was, and I suppose I should start with、uh, newspaper reviews. Contemporary reviews. Sorry. You want contemporary reviews? What's the name of the play? It's Happy Strangers. It was written in 1962, and we're supposed to write about its influence on American theater. You know, show why it's been so important. Well, that certainly explains why your professor wants you to read some of those old reviews. The critics really tore the play to pieces when it opened. It was just so controversial; nobody had ever seen anything like it on the stage. Really? Was that big a deal? Oh, sure. Of course, the critics' reaction made some people kind of curious about it. They wanted to see what was causing all the fuss. In fact, we were on vacation in New York. Oh, I had to be oh around sixteen or so, and my parents took me to see it. That would have been about nineteen sixty-five. Oh, so that was the year premiere. Great, but、uh, newspapers from back then aren't online. So how do I? Well, we have copies of old newspapers in the basement, and all the major papers publish reference guides to their articles, reviews, etc. You'll find them in the reference stacks in back, but I'd start with 1964. I think the play had been running for a little while when I saw it.、Mm, how'd you like it? I mean, it's just two characters on stage hanging around and basically doing nothing. Well, I was impressed. The actors were famous, and besides, it was my first time in a real theater. But you're right; it was definitely different from any plays that we'd read in high school. Of course, in a small town, the assignments are pretty traditional. Yeah, I've only read it, but it doesn't seem like it'd be much fun to watch. <laughs> the story doesn't progress in a in any sort of logical manner.、It、doesn't have any real ending either. It just stops. Honestly, you know, I thought it was kind of slow and boring. <laughs> well, I guess you might think that. But when I saw it back then, it was anything but boring. Some parts were really funny, but I remember crying too. But I'm not sure just reading it. You know, they've done this play at least once on campus. I'm sure there's a tape of the play in our video library. You might want to borrow it. That's a good idea. I'll have a better idea of what I really think of it before I read those reviews. I'm sure you'll be surprised that anyone ever found it radical, but you'll see why it's still powerful, dramatically speaking. Well, there must be something about it, or the professor wouldn't have assigned it. I'm sure I'll figure it out. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. The class is discussing animal behavior. Okay, the next kind of animal behavior I want to talk about might be familiar to you. You may have seen, for example, a bird that's in the middle of a mating ritual, and and suddenly it stops and preens. You know, it takes a few moments to straighten its feathers. And then returns to the mating ritual. This kind of behavior, this doing something that seems completely out of place, is what we call a displacement activity. Displacement activities are activities that animals engage in when they have conflicting drives. If, if we take our example from a minute ago, if the bird is afraid of its mate, it's conflicted. It wants to mate, but it's also afraid and wants to run away. So instead, it starts grooming itself. So the displacement activity, the the grooming, the straightening of its feathers, seems to be an irrelevant behavior. So, what do you think another example of a displacement activity might be? How about an animal that,、um, instead of fighting its enemy or running away, it attacks a plant or a bush? That's a really good suggestion, Carl. But that's called redirecting. The animal is redirecting its behavior to another object. In this case, the plant or the bush. But that's not an irrelevant or inappropriate behavior. The behavior makes sense. It's appropriate under the circumstances, but what doesn't make sense is the object the behavior is directed towards. Okay, who else? Carol, I think I read in another class about an experiment、um, where an object that the animal was afraid of was put next to its food, next to the animal's food, 
and the animal, it was conflicted between confronting the object and eating the food. So instead, it just fell asleep, like that. That's exactly what I mean. It, it, displacement occurs because the animal's got two conflicting drives, two competing urges. In this case, fear and hunger. And what happens is they inhibit each other. They cancel each other out in a way. And a third, seemingly irrelevant behavior surfaces through a process that we call disinhibition. Now, in disinhibition, the basic idea is that two drives that seem to inhibit, to hold back, a third drive. Well, well, they get in in the way of each other in a in a conflict situation and somehow lose control, lose their inhibiting effect on that third behavior, which means that the third drive surfaces. It, it's expressed in the animal's behavior. These displacement activities can include feeding, drinking, grooming, even sleeping. I mean, these are what we call comfort behaviors. So, why do you think displacement activities are so often comfort behaviors, such as grooming? Maybe because it's easy for them to do. I mean, grooming is like one of the most accessible things an animal can do. It's something they do all the time. And they have the the stimulus right there on the outside of their bodies in order to do the grooming, or if food is right in front of them, basically they don't have to think very much about those behaviors. Professor, isn't it possible that animals groom because they've gotten messed up a little from fighting or mating? I mean, if a bird's feathers get ruffled, or an animal's fur. Maybe it's not so strange for them to stop and, such as eating, drinking, or sleeping. What's interesting is that studies have been done that suggest that the animal's environment may play a part in determining what kind of behavior it displays. For example, there's a bird, the wood thrush. Anyway, when the wood thrush is in an attack-escape conflict, that is, it's caught between the two urges to escape from or to attack an enemy. If it's sitting on a horizontal branch, it'll wipe its beak on its perch. If it's sitting on a vertical branch, it'll groom its breast feathers. The immediate environment of the bird, its immediate,、um, its relationship to its immediate environment, seems to play a part in which behavior it will display. Listen to part of a lecture in a literature class. All right. So let me close today's class with some thoughts to keep in mind while you're doing tonight's assignment. You'll be reading one of Ralph Waldo Emerson's best-known essays, Self Reliance, and comparing it with his poems and other works. I think this essay has the potential to be quite meaningful for all of you. As young people who probably wonder about things like truth and where your lives are going, all sorts of profound questions. Knowing something about Emerson's philosophies will help you when you read Self Reliance. And basically, one of the main beliefs that he had was about truth. Not that it's something that we can be taught. Emerson says it's found within ourselves. So this truth, the idea that it's in each one of us. Is one of the first points that you'll see Emerson making in this essay. It's a bit abstract, but he's very into、uh, into each person believing his or her own thought, believing in yourself, the thought or conviction that's true for you. But actually, he ties that in with a sort of universal truth, something that everyone knows but doesn't realize they know. Most of us aren't in touch with ourselves in a way. So we just aren't capable of recognizing profound truths. It takes geniuses, people like, say, Shakespeare, who are unique because when they have a glimpse of this truth, this universal truth, they pay attention to it and express it, and don't just dismiss it like most people do. So Emerson is really into each individual believing in and trusting him or herself. 
you'll see that he writes about, well, first, conformity. He criticizes the people of his time for abandoning their own minds and their own wills for the sake of conformity and consistency. They try to fit in with the rest of the world, even though it's at odds with their beliefs and their identities. Therefore, it's best to be a nonconformist, to do your own thing, not worrying about what other people think. That's an important point. He really drives this argument home throughout the essay. When you're reading, I want you to think about that and why that kind of thought would be relevant to the readers of his time. Remember, this is 1838. Self-reliance was a novel idea at the time, and United States citizens were less secure about themselves as individuals and as Americans. The country as a whole was trying to define itself. Emerson wanted to give people something to really think about, help them find their own way, and uh, what it meant to be who they were. So that's something that I think is definitely as relevant today as it was then. Probably, um, especially among young adults like yourselves. You know, uh, college being a time to sort of really think about who you are and where you're going. Now, we already said that Emerson really emphasized nonconformity, right? As a way to sort of not lose your own self and identity in the world to have your own truth and not be afraid to listen to it? Well, he takes it a step further. Not conforming also means uh, not conforming with yourself or your past. What does that mean? Well, if you've always been a certain way or done a certain thing, but it's not working for you anymore or you're not content, Emerson says that it would be foolish to be consistent even with our own past. Focus on the future, he says. That's what matters more. Inconsistency is good. He talks about a ship's voyage, and this is one of the most famous bits of the essay, how the best voyage is made up of zigzag lines. Up close, it seems a little all over the place, but from farther away the true path shows, and in the end it justifies all the turns along the way. So, don't worry if you're not sure where you're headed or what your long-term goals are. Stay true to yourself and it'll make sense in the end. I mean, I can attest to that. Before, pretty interesting turns, and here I am, very happy with my experiences and where they've brought me. If you rely on yourself and trust your own talents, your own interests, don't worry. Your path will make sense in the end.